Uh, I'd like to begin uh, today by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet, um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and the elders from other communities that might be here today. Um, uh, Professor David Tullerton is um, probably very familiar to most of us here um, at Weehai. Um, he was appointed a lab laboratory head here um, at Weehai in 1997, and, and his research um, from that time um, until now has really focused on all things B cells. Uh, from the regulation of humoral responses um, to B-cell memory um, and how these cells uh, can lead to cancer and autoimmune disease um, uh, when they're dysregulated. Uh, he's recently been appointed as the head of department and uh, laboratory head of the Immune Memory Laboratory um, in the Department of Immunology and Pathology at Monash University. Um, thanks. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the, uh, for the invitation to bring me back. It's a bit like the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. Um, so, so this is the topic I thought I'd be really fancy and go totally overview kind of thing, the, uh, the immunity, the immunology of autoimmunity. That sounded great when I first decided on doing that about um, three or four weeks ago. And then as I started to read up on this, uh, which sort of gives away a little that I'm not so expert after all, uh, it turned out that this was a massive undertaking and, and there are you know, thousands of books written on this. And, and indeed, if I could just summarize this, and, and there's a little uh, learning guide here for the, for the students as well. Uh, if I quote something from Tolstoy, so all happy families are alike and each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So the aside is that if you're going to give a talk, you always should have at least one or two quotes from famous novels to start with. This, this is a good one. Whoops, as I go through it. And, and one of the reasons that, that I wanted to put that up is that here's a list of about a third of what are commonly considered to be autoimmune diseases. And I've only got up to the first of the eyes down here. Uh, it just keeps going and going. There are literally hundreds. And they're all quite distinct from each other. So to try and re uh, uh, reduce it to some sort of similarity or basic principle that would be consistent through all of them is clearly a massive undertaking and one that I'm not really qualified to do. So, so instead of that, I thought I would um, focus on one particular disease, one that my laboratory and myself had some interest in over the last, uh, over the last several years. But in keeping with the topic, try to, if you like, blend that in with the actual immune response what we know about the immune response and immunology. And, and in some way, I think that might have some resonance with a number of autoimmune diseases, which would show the same kind of abrogation or alteration of normal immunity to result in diseases, or sorry, some alteration in normal immunity to result in disease, but maybe that alteration will be distinct in each of the, in each of the processes. So, so here's immunology, the way that I see it. Uh, it's all about making antibody. Uh, and and uh, this is a, a picture from a review of Michael McKaiser Williams. Uh, also an alumnus of this institute. Um, uh, and it goes through both the priming through, through to the end, so it's really useful for, for the, what I want to cover. Uh, and in the first instance, to generate an immune response, there has to be activation. So antigen has to enter, lymphocytes have to be primed to that, uh, migrate towards each other, and, uh, and to generate a response. So there needs to be some specificity in the lymphocyte compartment in order to make a response. There also need to be um, signals associated with the antigen that will trigger uh, the sort of environment that's necessary to, to allow this to response to progress. And that's what we now currently know as, uh, as the inflammatory response. So after that process is initiated, there's, uh, there's proliferation and differentiation. So the first outcome of this uh, early interaction is the production of antibody secreting cells uh, uh, and non-germinal center memory cells. So, so very early on from this intersection of B and T cells, we get antibody being produced. So the specificity that was engaged here on this B cell is now present as circulating antibody as a result of that initial uh, interaction. But it progresses beyond that. 
uh, to include this additional phase, I keep hitting the wrong button, this additional phase uh, of a germinal center reaction. And in here, uh, B-cell affinity for, or the affinity of the B-cell receptor for the antigen is improved by successive rounds of somatic mutation, selection, uh, and cell death and proliferation. So death, uh, uh, selection, proliferation, mutation, and death, and so on. And those, uh, those processes can result in 10,000-fold improvements in the binding affinity of the antibody for the antigen uh, uh, and the production of long-lived effector cells, which is perhaps key to the disease that I'm going to, which is key to the disease I'm going to talk about. So out of the germinal center, we get high affinity B cells, and they will be represented in the memory compartment and in high affinity antibody secreting cells, or sorry, plasma cells secreting high affinity antibody. And the feature of these two groups of cells is their longevity. So memory B cells can persist as a population for decades in humans, uh, just recirculating through the body, waiting for, if necessary, the, uh, to be required to, to repeat this process on, on recall with the same antigen. The plasma cells that are made can migrate to the bone marrow and live there also for, for decades, providing uh, in normal circumstances long-lived immunity to, to, to whatever the invi invading antigen has been. But as we'll see in the case of autoimmune disease, that can be persistent long-lived auto-reactive antibody, uh, which can drive uh, uh, pathology and disease over, over many, many years. So in, in the normal circumstance, again, just to get to the end of this, uh, if, if that antigen is, uh, is encountered once more and if the level of antibody produced by these high affinity cells is not sufficient to provide protection to that insult, then these memory cells will be reactivated and recapitulate parts of this process not so much necessarily a germinal center reaction, but definitely immediate production of antibody secreting cells and even more uh, high affinity antibody being produced into the serum. So, so the, the stages are, are reasonably straightforward. You have to encounter an antigen. It has to be uh, the provision of T cell help. It has to be an environment that promotes their interaction, proliferation and differentiation. Out of that, one produces antibody. Ordinarily, that antibody, either the initial antibody and or the high affinity antibody that comes out of the germinal center is enough to resolve the insult, whatever that might have been. Uh, the antigen is removed from the system, inflammation diminishes, and, and this becomes self-limiting and shuts down. These uh, structures disappear, and one is left at the end with the recirculating memory cells and the long-lived antibody secreting cells as reminders. And the situation and the, and the, the, the situation goes back to effectively normal, back to the homeostatic stage it was prior to this insult. Antibody titers are more or less the same. Just now this specificity is, is apparent in it. So, so there are a lot of details associated with this. We have antigen, the, is the insult which initiates the, progr the, the program, and it's typically some sort of pathogenic protein, uh, a pathogen, a path the protein derived from that, or some other component derived from it, or of course, a vaccine. Uh, they're recognized in um, specific ways. There are the uh, pathogen, got fat thumbs it seems. There are pathogen associated um, uh, molecular uh, uh, proteins which are recognized by, by the pattern, sorry, which are recognized by specific receptors, we'll see in a minute. And these components are, are, are recognized by the innate system. There's antigen derived from them, which is recognized by the, um, by the uh, adaptive immune system. They have their specific sets of receptors. There are toll-like receptors, rig-like receptors, nod-like receptors, C, lectin-type receptors, complement, natural antibody, all of these pre-existing hardwired into the system to recognize aspects of of these various, uh, these various pathogens, specifically these components, and they trigger um, a response directly. And down amongst the, uh, the, um, the lymphocyte system, they have their specific antigen receptors of the B cell receptor and the T cell receptor also required to recognize the, the antigen. And the responses are, can be divided, if you like, into those from the innate system to produce cytokines and interferons they're probably the same thing, chemokines, and down here amongst the lymphocytes, there's priming, proliferation, and differentiation. And of course, as you'll be familiar from many of the talks in this forum, that these components, of course, feed into this. They, activate, they assist in the activation of cells in their proliferation and guide their differentiation to particular outcomes, such as the ones we were just looking at in forming a germinal center and cells differentiating into make antibody. 
And the end result of this is hopefully uh, uh, the production of this high affinity antibody or uh, cell-mediated immunity, which will remove whatever the antigen or the insult uh, has been, and, and, and then the resolution of the response and the diminution of inflammation and, and so on. So, so there are components to the system which are always present, uh, these ones. They're always looking for their ligands, if you like, or always ready to respond to their ligands by an immediate uh, production of these, of these pro-inflammatory components. These ones down here are meant to require greater uh, stimulus and a more sophisticated sense of determining what's wrong before initiating the response. So, so they require not only stimulation by antigen through their specific receptors, but as I said, uh, a, a corresponding uh, change in the environment that indicates this is an appropriate time to make a response. And typically that comes from this innate component. So the two arms coming together to create this outcome, which then, um, sorry, negates the antigen and, uh, uh, or removes the antigen and, and then reduces the response. Now, uh, this top part uh, has become an industry on its own right, and this is from a review recently uh, showing some of the signaling components. This is absolutely terrifying for most people, certainly me, to go from this point where the, where the, uh, the ligand binds to its receptor, in this case the TLRs, uh, and then goes through these various signaling components to and the bottom wind up in the production of cytokines and interferons. And the same for nucleic acids over here, so different ligands for effectively the same processes that have the same outcomes. Uh, there are, of course, the other components recognizing um, uh, RNA, or the rig-like receptors, uh, uh, the cytoplasmic DNA through the sting and, uh, and its upstream mediators of the modification of the DNA that produce, again, type 1 interferons, cytokines, and then um, uh, the TLR-inducible proteins uh, producing producing uh, inflammatory factors T and F and IL-6. So, so vast amounts of machinery is associated with the innate system to promote inflammation. And that's a key component of both the adaptive immune response but also uh, autoimmune diseases. And uh, many autoimmune diseases have dysregulated aspects of these inflammatory aspects. But they don't provide any specificity, if you like. They're common to many, many diseases and, and to cancer and to many other, many other circumstances. So they don't give any sort of specificity, if you like. They don't determine what the deleterious or pathogenic outcome of this process is going to be. But we'll see as we go through to the disease I'm going to talk about, which is lupus, that, that a number of the predisposing factors to lupus are associated with these signaling pathways. So they're not causative, but they are necessary, if you'd like, to be predisposed to have an inflammatory outcome. But there must be, and you should bear this in mind, we don't know exactly what they are, but there must be other factors that guide that predisposition to the particular outcome of making high affinity antibodies against uh, particular components, which are the basis of uh, the pathology of lupus. So I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about, um, about lymphocytes and particularly about B-cells, which as Joe mentioned, that's the only thing I think about when I'm at work and sometimes when I'm at home. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it stems from, from, from the person you're all familiar with, McFarlane Burnett, and, and his um, postulate of clonal selection, which was in the 50s. Uh, and he concluded as part of this theory, it's only a couple of pages long, read it, you should all read it, um, that if there is going to be this generation of random, uh, of clones with all pre-existing specificities, so a random distribution of specificities, a part of that process would be the development of cells that recognize self. And since at that point, uh, the autoimmune disease was not a widely recognized phenomenon, he reasoned that there must therefore be a means of, of purging those self-reactive cells which would be generated in his system from the repertoire and, and he called this clonal deletion. Uh, and the process uh, was referred to as becoming tolerant to self. So, so one can, can draw little um, dodgy pictures of it like this uh, with, with PowerPoint of how it works. And for B cells, which are on the right, and T cells on the left, it's essentially the same phenomenon that in the process of generating the antigen receptors, some proportion of them, some fraction, will be specific for a self-antigen. And that specificity will have a certain affinity, if you like, uh, and or avidity. And at a certain point, it will trigger the deletion of that cell which had that reactivity. So for B cells, it's just at the stage of being an immature B cell when it first expresses on its surface the complete immunoglobulin molecule, heavy chain and light chain together, uh, and has its specificity defined. And if that recognizes in the environment of the bone marrow, or or the fetal liver in, in the case of neonates, uh, in, in fetal development, if it recognizes an antigen present with sufficient affinity, it will be deleted and those reactivities will not emigrate out of the bone marrow into the periphery. 
The similar uh, process occurs in T-cell development, and I know I'm summarizing decades of work and, and lots of details in this, but at the equivalent point when the T-cell receptor is first on the surface, uh, if that recognizes self-peptide self, uh, with too high an affinity or avidity, then that cell is deleted and again purged from the repertoire. It's clear from lots of experiments, many of them done in this institute, uh, that with both T cells and B cells, there's a second opportunity for purging the repertoire when the cells migrate out of their developmental location, the, the bone marrow or the thymus, uh, and enter into the periphery. So these early cells are still susceptible to, to these signals, whatever they might be, that would result in their deletion uh, uh, and not their persistence. But the curious thing about um, both T cells and B cells is that they actually require stimulation through their receptors to survive, to develop and to survive. So, so to have this system of removing those cells which are self-reactive while still retaining a degree of self-reactivity means that there has to be some sort of threshold between deciding what's dangerous that needs to be removed and what's safe and should be retained uh, uh, for, for use in making responses. And so one can go from that previous dodgy drawing to an equally dodgy one here of of how that decision is made, which is that effectively the, through their specific receptors, the lymphocytes will determine, if you like, the strength of the interaction that they have with their environment from, from, uh, from through the receptor. And that interaction can fall into different categories quite arbitrarily listed here. So, for example, it could recognize absolutely nothing. And that's the equivalent of not actually making a productive receptor. So those cells will equally be deleted since they'll be regarded as not having completed the process. The interaction could be extremely strong, and as I've just said a couple of times, that will result in the deletion of those cells from too high a strength the interaction with their, with their self antigens. But as I also mentioned, for progression through the process, both T cells and B cells have to see antigen, have to see a get a stimulus through their receptor at some degree to keep them alive. And one can show that with B cells in, a, in very elegant experiments from Morevsky's laboratory many years ago of inducing the deletion of the B cell receptor, and those cells immediately underwent apoptosis. So they require constant stimulation at a low level through their receptors, both to continue their development, to finish their development, and then to survive afterwards. So there's a, a zone of this strength which would be suggested to be positive selection. The cells receive that, they progress through the last stages of division and will stay alive in the periphery. But between these two, there's going to be an area where it's not so clear what to do, uh, whether the cells are left in the, in the repertoire or deleted, maybe up to some level of happenstance, if you like, on what the actual circumstances were, the dose of the antigen, the number of receptors expressed by the cell, and so on, could result in some level of overlap between what's um, guaranteed to be maintained and specific for an exogenous antigen uh, without causing any disease to the self or those that will be too dangerous for self-reactivity and we will be deleted. So what sort of evidence is there in the B cell system for this process operating and for cells sitting here in this middle zone? So these are some um, experiments done from the Nussenzweig lab in, in Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefeller University in New York several years ago, in which they recovered B cells from different stages of either the bone marrow or the periphery of a number of humans. Uh, and from single cells reconstituted the receptors, had them expressed a secreted antibody, and then checked what they were reactive for. And what they're measuring is reactivity to DNA, and that is a classic self-reactivity. It's associated with many diseases, and particularly uh, lupus. Uh, or what they called polyreactivity, which was a collection of, they listed up here, of self and foreign antigens. So one antibody recognizing a bunch of different things which are not necessarily related to each other is called, in this loose term, uh, polyreactivity. And it's a sign, if you like, a precursor often of autoreactivity, since a number of those polyreactive determinants are, are self. So what can, one can see from this is here in the bone marrow, uh, where they took the receptors from, uh, from, these, um, from these patients and looked at early immature, uh, these sorry, weren't patients, healthy volunteers, these early immature B cells and then immature B cells, so one step and then the next, the, the proportion of those, uh, of those cells, of those B cell specificities that recognize DNA, see it goes from about 80% down to 50%. So even though there's only three dots and two dots, I hope David Bowe's not in the audience, uh, that was regarded as, a, as a, an example of the, uh, of the introduction of a tolerance um, checkpoint, if you like, that the change in the frequency of self-reactivity between this stage and this stage reflected the loss of those cells at that developmental point. Um, 
In the, and the same was true even more markedly here with the polyreactivity where it dropped from about 60% down to about 10%. So there's a clear change in the specificity of the B cell population at that developmental point. And as they went from the, uh, into the periphery between the two stages of the newly emigrant cells and then the more established cells, there was another decline. So again, that possibly is significant. They're very tightly clustered around each other, but again, reflective of some change in the repertoire associated with becoming a mature, persistent, recirculating cell. The polyreactivity at the bottom is not changing since that's already quite, uh, quite a, low, uh, um, a low event. But I would point out that, that while this is quite um, striking, if you like, in the change in reactivity from early development to the recirculating cells, Neither at this point in polyreactivity or in the anti-DNA is that actually zero. So there are cells which are making antibody, which is reactive to self, uh, and they're quite happily recirculating through the, through the, through the periphery of, of all of us. Uh, and so we all have the potential, if you like, to make uh, autoreactive antibodies. And so we just need a change in circumstances and the right or the wrong collection of genes to allow that to happen and not only happen, but to then take hold and to become a progressive and form an immune response. So I've already given to some extent the punchline away, and I think you already knew that there are, of course, autoimmune diseases. Uh, and, uh, and, and here's a, a selection of them. This is from the uh, Rheumatoid Arthritis Society. So they have rheumatoid arthritis as the most common one, uh, and it's about 1%, so about 1,000 per 100,000 individuals, at least in the United States. Um, and the, I think, yeah, if I can just quite read it, they reckon the overall estimate is between 3 to 6% amongst, uh, amongst adults, which puts it as a general condition uh, behind heart disease and cancer as the third most prevalent form of disease. But, but as I alluded to at the very beginning, any kind of reading on autoimmunity will tell you that it's not a uniform state or condition. Each of them is, each disease is relatively, has m many quite distinct uh, attributes. Um, Here's a slightly different uh, uh, take on this. This one is from uh, Johns Hopkins, and it breaks down, well, it, uh, it adds Graves' disease as the most common, but the thing that it provides is one of the still remaining really curious attributes of autoimmune disease is that they're much more common in females than males. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about towards the latter part of this talk is systemic lupus erythematosus, which has about a 90% incidence in women uh, uh, over, overall. But that's repeated pretty much in most of the autoimmune diseases. Um, so, so they're relatively common, uh, uh, often not particularly debilitating and can be managed by, by relatively um, generic approaches and don't require you know, sort of Herculean intervention that, that one might see, for example, with, uh, with cancer. Um, but one can learn a lot, if you like, on the, uh, from the pathology of these diseases about the causative nature of them and try to go back a little bit from the specificity or the specific diseases to those things that are general to look at whether one could develop, if you like, better therapies in general or more specific therapies in those cases where the generic approaches are not, uh, are not successful. So to get into the disease that, um, that I'm going to focus on, uh, which just goes through some, some attributes. So, so in terms of uh, antibody-mediated diseases and autoimmune di diseases in general, they're divided into those that are systemic and those that are local. And this effectively means whether the target of the disease is a specific protein or structure which is located in one particular place or whether they're reactive to a range of different um, targets and therefore cause disease in many locations around the body. And there are some classic ones over here of rheumatoid arthritis, which causes uh, disease or pathology in a large number of joints. Lupus, which will attack many organs. We'll see a little bit about that in the more. Sjogren's syndrome and the anchor associated vasculitis, uh, muscle, psoriasis and vitigo, and, and so on. And then more specific ones down, down here where a particular um, aspect of or one target exists, such as platelets or components of the skin in pemphigus. Uh, Graves' disease and diabetes and, and so on. So lots of diversity in, in what they attack and how they attack them and over what distribution uh, and, and, uh, and what the causative factors might be. So having um, said that, that a lot of these are mediated by antibody um, uh, and that there's, it's actually not so clear cut uh, as, as that. So if one looks at um, lists that are produced uh, of antibody involvement in autoimmune diseases, then one can find that there are actually in almost all of them antibodies against self, against components of self. The really difficult thing is, being, is to demonstrate uh, that that antibody is pathogenic. Uh, 
Uh, and in fact, it's only been proven with a sort of real uh, rigor for, for maybe three or four uh, of these diseases. And by rigor, I mean you have to actually demonstrate that the antibody uh, can be taken from a disease setting, transferred into another individual, animal circumstance, uh, and can cause the disease. Uh, it's been done for Graves' disease. Um, uh, I think it's one that I can remember offhand, but for many of the others, it's not, it's not so clear. For the others, it's surrogate uh, 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 indicators that the antibody is pathogenic or would be pathogenic, and that's showing in an in vitro circumstance that it mimics some of the pathology that's seen in vivo by either blocking or stimulating a particular hormone receptor, for example, uh, or it's inferential uh, by using animal models, by recapitulating the production of the antibody if you like, or a disease similar to this in, in animals and, and showing that the same antibodies uh, exist. And at the bottom here are some examples of autoantibodies, one with uh, antibodies to the gastric parietal cells in pernicious anemia, where it has been demonstrated that antibodies are pathogenic, and here in, uh, in lupus, where the antibodies are to, are to antinuclear antigens, where I think it's reasonable to say that, that the evidence is still uh, strongly inferential, that these antibodies are, are pathogenic. Okay, so, so in these other cases, there are circumstances where the antibodies are not pathogenic, but B cells still have an involvement. And that's been demonstrated by what I think I'll get to in another short while, by use of um, B cell depleting agents. But they can participate in not just the production of antibody, but in these other ways in, in contributing to disease. So B cells can be the initiators of uh, lymphoid structures uh, or lymphoid organogenesis, uh, and that seems to be their role in diseases like uh, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, or at least contributions to disease pathology. Uh, of course, B cells are antigen-presenting cells, so they will acquire a specific antigen through their receptors, processed and presented to T cells, and promote their activation and production of cytokines from them. And that seems to be one of their roles in multiple sclerosis and in lupus and also in arthritis. And of course, the antibody that they make uh, will bind the specific antigen. And in binding this antigen, if the antigen is the correct structure or configuration, it can generate immune complexes which are quite significantly pro-inflammatory and can themselves result in the, uh, in the uh, production of pathology. And that's in part how antibodies contribute or B cells contribute to lupus, arthritis, and in autoimmunity associated with hepatitis. Uh, and there are then again the specific uh, the antibodies which are specific for particular targets and binding to that target causes the disease. And that's in Graves' disease, myasthenia gravis, pemphigus, and in, autolytic he in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So lots of ways that they are contributing to disease, some of them overlapping in disease. You'll see that the lupus occurs in these three different columns, sorry, in two of the columns, uh, arthritis in two, and so on. So lots of contributions um, to this. So the disease I'm going to um, discuss in a little bit more detail is, um, is lupus. Um, you probably saw from that schematic, it's quite a rare autoimmune disease. Um, but it's in those cases where it's not managed by these um, initial or frontline therapies, it can actually be extremely debilitating and can result in, in death uh, uh, in the worst cases. So it's... Uh, it's still considered to be a uh, condition, so I'll just go through some of this. Its name comes from, from the uh, appearance of the skin lesions, which apparently at one point was evocative of a wolf's bite, so hence the lupus or lupine. Um, it's a chronic disease, often severe. It's obviously autoimmune and, as I said, sometimes lethal. It's quite variable uh, in clinic, in the clinical appearance. Uh, one of the defining characteristics of people who have it are autoantibodies, uh, particularly antibodies to, to double-stranded DNA that we've mentioned uh, already. Um, there are immune complexes being deposited, and those together are causing inflammation. There are rashes, this malar rash, which was shown just a moment, a moment uh, vascular damage, uh, renal disorders, and uh, neurological disorders. And these last three are quite, quite severe. Um, Lots of genes have been associated as predisposing or causative or contributing to the disease, and there are also environmental uh, influences, of course. It has this strong predisposition or preponderance in females to males, uh, 90%, uh, and it also shows quite a, quite a, a significant racial um, distribution. The highest incidence is in, is in African Americans, uh, um, and I think Asians are also very common and Caucasians least common. <laughs> 
So here are some of the pathology of the, of the disease. This is a, a normal uh, glomerulus, and this is the uh, glomerulus from a patient with, uh, with renal lupus, and shows an inflammation associated with the deposition of antibody and immune complexes in there, or the cells infiltrating, which block the capacity of the glomerulus to function properly and filter, and, and hence ultimately when enough of these are disabled, there'll be uh, renal failure. Uh, in that same glomerulus, there would be all of this complement deposited. So the antibody is not just being, uh, being, being put in that location, it's actually activating its effective functions of fixing complement, and that in part response, results in the infiltration of these inflammatory cells uh, and the destruction of the tissue. The antibody and immune complexes are also deposited on blood vessels, which results again in inflammation, and that causes the vasculitis. Uh, and one attribute of that is shown here in this malar or butterfly-shaped rash on the uh, uh, on the cheek on the cheekbones. So, so it is really strong evidence that anti that uh, indications that antibody is involved, and and that's one of the reasons that we became interested in it, since we're interested in antibody production. But to get to the sort of the vagaries, if you like, of the cause of these diseases, one comes to figures such as this, and from a quite recent review from, from Ann Davidson, uh, an Australian who's working in the United States, um, you get a sort of a figure like this with boxes and, and a few and a squiggly line. So I don't know where it actually starts. You have genetic predisposition, okay, that could be present in, in many people, uh, some sort of environmental trigger. Um, sorry, uh, environmental triggers and uh, activation of the innate immune system. But as I mentioned in the beginning, there are, uh, inflammation underlies a vast number of autoimmune diseases and other states. So that in itself is not sufficient to lead to, uh, to lupus specifically. There need to be other components to it, which to, to put you out of your uh, suspense, uh, are not yet identified. So somehow in this environment of genetic predisposition, environment and uh, activation of the immune system, a specific adaptive immune response is triggered, uh, which creates uh, antibody, which binds to this antigen, whatever that might be. DNA is often considered to be the most likely candidate, um, or, or DNA uh, protein complexes, uh, resulting in the deposition or the formation of immune complexes, which are deposited, and then trigger this uh, inflammatory response, and then it progresses from there in this cyclical way. But to go back to the immunology part, that all of this bit, forget the genetic predisposition, but the environmental trigger, the innate response, the adaptive immune response, and the formation of immune complexes, that's all perfectly normal. That's exactly what the system's designed to do. So the only, the only problem is, is essentially whether this uh, is the correct response to start with, uh, this is the correct response to start with, and whether these two things occur at the same time in the same person to create that opportunity, if you like, to make self-reactive antibodies that create these immune complexes. Now, even that might be sufficient if the self-antigen was depleted in the characteristic way of an immune response, which would take out, if you like, the driver of this process and stop it as a normal immune response is stopped. Um, but that doesn't seem to happen, and instead this goes through cycles of, uh, of amplification, effectively, of response after response, making, as it turns out, as the system is designed to do, better and better antibodies in this point, which means that at even lower and lower concentrations, they are able to, uh, to generate immune complexes of higher affinity and potentially higher avidity. And at some point in this iterative process, then clinical symptoms will appear. The person will feel unwell, go to the doctor, and after uh, some diagnostic tests will be uh, given the label of having, of having lupus. So they'll then be put on these therapeutic regimes, which in the beginning and for the vast majority of people are, are completely satisfactory. Um, but in some, they become resistant or not responsive to the therapy at all, and then ultimately there will be uh, irreversible tissue damage in that subgroup, and that can be, of course, quite devastating and in some cases, in some cases um, lethal. So it's in the people in this particular disease of lupus who fall into this part that uh, there's a lot of effort going into to find better therapies that can, if you like, stop this progressing and, if possible, even reverse some of this to get it back to a state uh, prior to the onset of any pathology. So what are some of these um, predisposing factors? So here's, um, uh, sorry, it's a little bit blurry, but this is from just a couple of years ago, um, 2013, of uh, a summary of some of the, uh, of the top polymorphisms associated with, uh, with, uh, with lupus. So GWAS, a collection 
of GWAS studies that have been done, and there have been a heap of them done in lupus and many other autoimmune diseases. And the, the, the end result of this, there are about 50 or so uh, 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 polymorphisms um, associated with, uh, significantly, very highly significantly associated with the, with the onset and development of lupus. Uh, and rather than show all 50, what this is, table does is to group them into particular um, categories or compartments of immune responsiveness, if you like. So the top is the MHC, so HLA, the incompatibility loci, recognition. So that's not so surprising. This is an autoimmune disease. So these key regulators of the immune system, uh, one would imagine, would be strongly associated with disease. But it's um, particular haplotypes, of uh, HLA, DRB1, for example, which are most strongly associated. So there's really high significance of association, but the so-called odds ratio, so you your increased risk, effectively, of developing the disease if you have these alleles is only between two and three. So it's not huge, it, but it's a, it is the strongest predisposing factor. Um, next to those, those things that affect T cell signaling, and some of these are negative regulators of T cells. This one here is a phosphatase. Next is B cell signaling, and there are a whole bunch of factors down here that are associated with B cell responsiveness and differentiation. Uh, then there are these innate systems, uh, I feel like the, uh, the interferon and TLR signaling, uh, NF-kappa B signaling, which NF-kappa B is in everything, so that's also not so surprising. Uh, and then down here at the bottom is the, is the, um, the uh, how to deal with immune complexes, so the response of the cells of the innate system to the, um, to the deposition of immune complexes on the surface. So virtually every aspect of the immune response from, from, from uh, the recognition of antigen to the production of an inflammatory environment to the response of the lymphocytes to that signal to their subsequent differentiation and reactivity, there are uh, alterations in the genes controlling that that are associated with the onset of disease. So none of them individually is going to be causative. Uh, uh, they are, if you like, just all predisposing towards that particular outcome. And what's shown on the right-hand side in these, in these initials, you don't need to know what they are, is the number of other autoimmune diseases that these um, polymorphisms are, are associated with. So there's obviously a lot of, as I've said a couple of times, of underlying uh, redundancy in the development of autoimmune diseases, that, that predisposing factors to one will be common to others. And whether you wind up with a particular disease presumably depends upon the unique combination of these that you have, the particular environment that you're, that you're sitting in, and, and maybe also just um, particularly uh, bad luck, depending upon the environmental antigen that, you are, that you're exposed to. So, so, you know, lots of causative changes, and I'd just like to focus in a little bit more on, on, on the B cell compartment. So I showed you this slide earlier on, which was the, um, the introduction of tolerance or the purging of the B cell repertoire during development in humans uh, with the loss of polyreactivity and the reduction in anti-DNA. So those are normal people. So is there some evidence that that's not occurring in, in patients with lupus? So that would be clearly one of the predisposing factors would be to have a higher incidence of self-reactive B cells. And it turns out that that is or may be true. So this is um, uh, the same group uh, uh, published several, um, several years later, uh, so about a decade ago now, in which they took uh, three patients with juvenile onset lupus, which is itself a bit unusual, so, so maybe this is not entirely representative, uh, and compared it with controls. And they did the same experiment of isolating B cells, cloning the receptors from individual B cells, and then reconfiguring the, reconstructing the, the antibody and seeing what it reacted with. And here is um, uh, whether these cells are reactive with, uh, with anti-nuclear antigens, and this particular test is, uh, is a very common one, looking for antibody binding to, uh, to the nucleus of liver cells grown on the slide. And here in newly emigrant B cells, so out of the blood, here's a control group, and here are the patients, pretty similar. But when we get to mature naive B cells, so the next developmental stage along, in the control group, those specificities are much diminished, but they're retained to an abnormally high degree in the lupus patients. So, so of course, a huge caveat in this I'll get to in a moment. Uh, and the same with the polyreactivity. Here in the immature cells, here it is in the lupus patients, already quite high in the periphery, uh, and retained into the mature cells to a much, much greater degree than, than in the controls. 
Now, of course, the problem is these patients already have lupus, right? So, so there may have been some bias in what's gone on in the development of the disease prior to clinical symptoms or even after the onset that's expanded this particular kind of B cell at the expense of normal ones, even though they have a normal, a normal phenotype as far as it was assessed in this case. But clearly there's an alteration in the B cell composition. And even if it is a disease-specific um, thing, so that there's now a much higher incidence or retention of pathogenic, potentially pathogenic cells, you can see how easily that would contribute to ongoing disease once it had been started. So to put all of these um, uh, factors together, one winds up with an incredibly messy and complicated looking picture like, like this from the same review of, uh, of Ann Davidson. Where, and the interesting thing for me about this is there's no start point, right? You just, you just dive in wherever and, uh, and you wind up going round and round. So, so one could imagine, and, and her view is that it starts with, uh, with antibodies being produced against uh, DNA that creates a DNA covered with chromatin, so it's protein DNA uh, um, uh, complexes. Uh, that's uh, a trigger for or able to be recognized by neutrophils, which create their own pro-inflammatory environments. It's picked up by um, plasmacytodendritic cells, which may or may not be predisposed to over-respond to that, to create interferons, uh, which themselves uh, then keep the whole system going and rev it up to an additional level. Um, some of these factors will promote myelodendritic cells to make BAF, which is a B cell survival and differentiation factor, necessary for B cell persistence at, at, a, at a, some, a certain level, but when overexpressed, overexpressed promotes the retention and differentiation of autoreactive cells. So somehow just from making or the existence of this antibody it triggers a couple of steps through the innate system to feed back onto B cell survival and differentiation. Uh, and these cells will also potentially promote the, um, the priming and, uh, of, uh, of uh, self-specific T cells, which can then provide the, the drive to the B cells that improve the antibody that they're making through germinal centers, change the isotype to make them IgGs, which are increasingly pathogenic and, and so on. And in these boxes are the polymorphisms and genes thought to be associated with the development of disease. So see how they fall into those groups and those groups affect the different stages of what is, except for the fact that it's a self-antigen, a completely normal uh, immune response. So somehow there's been, if you like, a re misfocusing of the system onto a self-antigen. And it may not be, you know, we, we all uh, can be, uh, will have at certain times anti-DNA antibodies in our serum. There's nothing unusual about that. It's present in most people at any particular point. The incidence with disease is that it progresses beyond this point where, where the antibodies might be recognized, the DNA, to triggering the subsequent stages. Or alternatively, that inputs into these stages promote the production of higher levels of antibody or different antibody from those cells that are otherwise uh, uh, in a benign state. So the antibody in lupus is, uh, is the pathogenic agent. Uh, it has these kind of outcomes depending upon the, the manifestation of the disease. Uh, it can result in, uh, in, I think that's a, in a glomerulus, is that right? Yeah, causing destruction of the, of the tissues. Um, is that right? No, podocyte, yeah. So uh, or it can result in the deposition of immune complexes on, on tissue, on, on blood vessels, and inflammation, which destroys the vessels themselves. And it can also result in, uh, in, in neurological symptoms associated with antibody getting through the blood-brain barrier and binding uh, in, in to, to neurons. Uh, and they have a lot of very unfortunate manifestations. So, so if antibodies are a feature of uh, of lupus, of pathology of lupus, which they clearly are, then addressing antibody production should be a way of addressing disease pathology. So one could imagine that in the case we've just been describing where B cell specific for self activated by T cell specific for self is induced to make antibody, if one could remove these cells, then one could in principle take away the antibody and remove, uh, and remove the pathology. And there are various ways, a lot of ways that this has been tried. And the most obvious, which probably many of you are aware of from, from its success in cancer therapy has been the, and, and rheumatoid arthritis has been the use of uh, rituximab uh, specific for CD20. So it's an incredibly effective uh, antibody for the depletion of B cells uh, from those people who are given uh, these infusions. And the B cell depletion will last for many months, up to a year, I think, nine months to a year, before they begin to, to reappear. Um, so extremely successful, uh, well, successful in uh, RA patients who were not responsive to TNF. Um, 
Uh, and in that case, it's actually been shown that, that, that there's often remission, uh, relapse of the disease when the B cells reappear. So um, has it been used in lupus? And the answer is yes, it has. It's been tried in a bunch of autoimmune diseases shown down here. Uh, and in lupus nephritis, it was actually found to be effective, uh, but it was not approved as a therapy because of the side effects um, associated with it, which in two of the trials uh, actually were, were some of the people in the trials unfortunately died from opportunistic infections. So the level of suppression, if you like, in their immune system was far too great uh, relative to the benefit that they might have received. Obviously dead, they're not going to receive any benefit, but that the other people uh, receive from, from, from the depletion of the B cells. And interestingly, uh, rituximab has actually been shown to be uh, effective in a large number of autoimmune diseases, but has not been licensed for any of them uh, except for, or approved for anything by the FDA, except for in one of the forms of, uh, of ANCA, Wegener's uh, syndrome, uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting. So, so B cell depletion has been tried. It's sort of effective. It's not curative. Uh, and it was mildly beneficial, but with obviously side effects too great to allow its, um, its widespread use. And this is, I know you can't read it, but it's just to overwhelm you with you, like the list of things that have been attempted as biological targets or targets for biological agents in, in lupus. Um, and shown here is one, a tassicept, which we'll get to just in a moment. And up here are the cluster of CD20 specific antibodies. And none of them have been, have been approved, except for this one here, uh, which is bulimumab, uh, which is specific for BAF. And I just briefly mentioned that uh, on, my way, on my way through. Um, so BAF is a, typically thought of as a survival factor for B cells. It's, um, it's produced by, by monocytes. Uh, and the level is, uh, is, if you like, in balance with the B cell population. So B cells use it up, stay alive, and then uh, somewhat more is made. So, so there's a direct relationship between the amount of BAF and, B, and the number of B cells surviving. If B cells are reduced, the amount of BAF is then increased because it's not being used. Or if there's inappropriate stimulation of these cells, there's excess BAF and, uh, and B cells accumulate as a result, and often autoreactive B cells. So in disease states such as lupus, where BAF is found to be elevated in a number of patients, uh, there's meant to be again this cyclical amplification of this process where by making antibody to DNA, for example, it triggers uh, uh, plasma cytotendritic cells, provide interferon, which promotes the myeloid cells to make BAF, which then promotes the survival uh, and differentiation of the B cells, which are making this antibody in the first place. So, so BAF, which is an approved therapy, has a good rationale for, for being a target, for being a, a, um, a potential target. Uh, and various antibodies or inhibitors of BAF were tried, uh, ones that recognize just BAF itself, um, others that blocked BAF binding to, uh, or BAF or its, uh, its homologue April binding to its specific, their specific subsets of receptors, TASI and BCMA, whereas BAF, for example, binds, uh, is the only one capable of binding specifically to the BAF receptor. So they've all been tried, and um, the BAF-specific one, bulimumab, is the only one that, uh, that achieved um, significance in, in the trials and was licensed. Uh, and that's what's um, shown here. It's the actual excerpt from the paper in Lancet, which reported on the phase three trial. And, and a couple of things I'll point out. These are just the parameters that were used. And the gray line uh, is the placebo, and the other two are higher increasing doses of bulimumab. So at each case, the purple line is the highest dose and shows the best response. So reduction in flares, um, uh, highest response, lower frequency of flares, uh, the physician's assessment, they're getting, people are getting look like they're getting better, uh, lower doses of steroids, uh, which they're otherwise on, changes in, in complement concentration, so increased complement, so there's no longer chronic activation of complement, and drop in, in anti-DNA antibodies. So, so clearly effective, but still not curative, right? and only works uh, in a proportion of patients. So, so it's, um, it's beneficial, um, but again, it's not curative. So to understand what might be better is to ask, well, what, what's driving the response itself? What are the antigens that are, that are um, uh, targeted by this autoimmune disease? And then it gets really messy. So DNA is often used. It's very easy to measure, and it's present in all people. But, but if one looks at uh, the assessment of the antibodies present in, in uh, lupus patients and what they're recognizing, there's a vast number of autoantigens. So well over 100. I think it's up to about 120 or 30 now. So a huge array of specificities and reactivities potentially developing in these patients, meaning that an antigen-based approach may be very, very difficult to, uh, to determine. Um, 
But it may be that one can intervene rather at the specificity, but somewhere post that at the at things that are common to them, like the reactivity and reactivation of the, of the cells. And there was a paper published um, last year, I think, in Nature Immunology, which was a really great analysis. The first uh, that I was aware of um, application of deep sequencing to the B-cell compartments of lupus patients undergoing uh, flares, so actually in the, in the throes of, uh, of a bout of autoantibody production and, and pathology. And I came to some really interesting conclusions, which I'll just try to summarize in this next slide. So this is, um, again, my uh, dodgy version of a normal immune response. So here are antigen-specific B cells. Forgot about the T cells and germinal centers. So in the presence of antigen, they, un they generate plasma cells, undergo somatic mutation, make more plasma cells, and make memory cells. And those memory cells, when re-exposed to antigen, will be induced to redifferentiate to make more antibody, and so on. So just a pared-down version of that, uh, of that immunity scheme. Um, and these cells are, are high affinity, if you like, and the antibody that they make is going to be high affinity. But of this population, only a small number are ever induced to redifferentiate uh, when, when re-exposed to the antigen, so even though the population is relatively large. What um, was determined by looking at this process in lupus patients was that there were a number of abnormalities, and it was done by uh, sequencing the variable region genes at really great depth and mapping those like between clones, for example, at different stages and different times uh, in these patients. And, and I'm sorry about the way that this looks. It's, um, it's, it's sort of it's complicated to, to some degree, but in, in lupus patients, what was found was that Yep, there were predisposing B cells, and yes, they did undergo somatic mutation to make antigen-specific um, memory cells, which showed high affinity. But there was also the persistence of, of self-reactive B cells in a quasi-activated state. So they weren't mutated, they weren't differentiating to have the full uh, uh, compartment of memory, but they persisted throughout. So in single patients, they could recover them at different times, uh, and they could show in looking at the flares that those cells were re, uh, if you like, initiating this process and producing more plasma cells specific for the antigen. In addition to that, there were conventional type memory cells specific for self-antigen, which were also being activated to make high affinity antibody in the flares. So one consequence of this is that the thought that the reason the BAF might be successful is because it targets both this type of cell and, uh, and, uh, and these cells back here, whereas rituximab might have only been targeting the naive cells prior to their differentiation or assumption of this activated state, which might give resistance to, to rituximab treatment after all. The other thing which was interesting in this was that in this process of looking at what was activated during a flare, that a number of conventional memory cells were induced to, um, to differentiate and produce antibody. So increased in, in representation in the flare were antibodies for tetanus toxoid and flu. So things people have been vaccinated against years before but were not exposed to at the time of the flare. So there's a kind of generalized activation of immune memory in the recrudescence of the disease or reappearance during a flare. So there's a unique population of cells, a naive looking cell that's activated and persists for months. There are also, it seems, longevity of the antibody secreting cells since in the circulating blood in between flares from individual patients, they were able to recover plasma cells which they had seen appearing in the flare some weeks or months beforehand. So there's inappropriate survival of different B cell types uh, in, um, uh, in, these, in, the, in these patients. So um, I've completely run out of time. I've totally uh, underestimated how long I was going to talk, but I'll just finish with, um, which is only about yeah, two thirds of the way through, with where one might uh, one might go with this. I'll come back next week. Don't worry. Um, uh, is that if knocking out B cells is not sufficient because one persists, one has persisting antibody uh, and cells that are resistant to reflection, then maybe one could find a therapy based on the targeting of the plasma cells themselves. That was going to lead ultimately to the work that we're doing in, in lupus, but that I'm clearly not getting the time for that. But I'll just show you one thing, which um, one adaption of another therapy into autoimmune disease, which is becoming increasingly common. This is another cancer-based drug, bortezomib, uh, which at least in 2004, when, when this was written, was thought to uh, operate. It does operate by being a proteasome inhibitor, but that was thought to uh, uh, result in the failure to fully activate NF-kappa B, and so in the loss of NF-kappa B signaling, uh, that would result in the death of the cell. It's more likely that this itself, the failure of the proteasome to deal with the unfolded or to participate in the correct uh, maintenance of the unfolded protein response triggers apoptosis, but, but either way, bortezomib acts through the proteasome and kills cells. So it was used in, it is used as a first-line therapy now in multiple myeloma and plasma 
cells are uniquely sensitive to this in large part because they are protein production factories and clearly need uh, highly active proteasomes to, to manage that process. So, so this is where um, a group in Germany decided, well, if, if it works for myeloma, maybe we can use it for autoimmune diseases that use antibody. And here's a, um, a model system where they show the treatment with bortezomib in these mice, uh, diminish the amount of circulating autoantibody. Uh, there are the plasma cells. They look pretty rotten, uh, so it seems to be working. I tried in another mouse model, this one of lupus, and there's the difference, if you like, by treating the animals with bortezomib, diminishes a lot of the pathology associated with autoimmunity and the and autoantibody particularly anti-DNA. And then more recently, they've actually tried it in lupus patients. Uh, and this was published about a year ago. This is reasonably heroic because this, uh, this, this, um, this, uh, this therapy is actually quite debilitating. And this was a collection of patients who were refractory to all other therapies. So, so really in a very, very poor condition. Uh, so they had 12 and they treated them with what are effectively the doses of bortezomib one would use for myeloma uh, and showed in a number of them improvements in, in outcome. So as you might see, I think I wrote it down here, that of the 12 patients, um, seven of them had to be withdrawn from adverse events, so it's not benign by any sense. Uh, but this is the, the data that they reported from these patients after the bortezomib treatment. And I'd just like to point out this, the cycles of treatment. There were no controls, so it was just those, those 12 patients um, who, who were treated that many of the parameters of disease, uh, such as protein urea, uh, disease indicator score, and DNA antibodies all dropped down as a result of the therapy, and many of these patients improved um, significantly. So it shows that targeting plasma cells is going to be, I think, a valid uh, route to disease and will have beneficial effects by reducing pathogenic antibody and reversing some, some of the symptoms. But ultimately, um, the curing of the disease or the, the remission of the disease is going to require interventions at many steps. But by studying it, we're finding really interesting aspects of the uh, diversion, if you like, of a normal immune responses that result in the result in pathology. You know, I'm really sorry for talking so long. I'll, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. People don't want to go to lunch. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry for cutting you short. You didn't cut me short. I mean, just Thanks ran for out cutting time. yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, is it no? No, it's not. Uh, so there are a number of. I mean, it's associated with changes in hormones. With whether that in turn. So there was recently a study, for example, uh, looking at the relationship of microbiome and uh, diabetes, which suggested that there was in turn going back from that a relationship between sex hormones and the microbiome. Uh, and the microbiome influenced the uh, degree of inflammation that was associated with the onset of, um, of an immune challenge or even an autoimmune challenge. So perhaps the same sort of thing, but the, the male-female imbalance is, like a, is predisposing in almost all of the autoimmune diseases. So whatever is very fundamental to the process that goes wrong in patients. Uh, I'm not quite sure. So, do you mean is there a, like a, a line, an affinity that the receptor has to have to be deleted beyond that? It is, and below that, it's not. Um, the, yes and no. Um, so, so in cases where that has been examined, uh, model systems where a defined antigen is introduced and one can manipulate the affinity of the antibody to that antigen, you can certainly find affinities at which there is no deletion. Uh, you can then find affinities at which a process called energy is, is enacted, so the cells have clearly recognized it, but they're now rendered into a state in which they're no longer responsive to that antigen and entering into a differentiation process. Uh, and so those have particular values, and, and one could presumably go through incremental stages and find out for that particular antigen where it was. So, so yes, that is true, but whether it's the same for every antigen is, uh, is not clear. All right, uh, well, um, the students can join David in the, uh, I think, in the boardroom um, for lunch. I'll bring the rest of my talk. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, 20 more slides here. <laughs>